Okay, well, uh, so where we are in the book, um, at the end almost, well, that is at the end of the Doctrine of Elements. <clears throat> Right, so in the doctrine of elements, there's the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. Right, so this was about pure sensibility. This is about the pure understanding. And this was the positive part about how synthetic a priori metaphysical knowledge is possible. And this is the negative part about why we think that other kinds are possible, even though they're they're not. Uh, it's about the transcendental illusion. Um, and this had two parts: the concepts of pure reason and the dialectical inferences or dialectical procedure of reason and its inferences. And then there's three parts of that corresponding to the two, the three transcendental ideas. So there's the paralogisms. Corresponding to the transcendental idea of the self. And there's the antinomy. Corresponding to the transcendental idea of the world as a whole. And now we're in the last one, which is the ideal, which corresponds to the transcendental idea of God. Um, and uh, just to like summarize again, the basic situation here, um, In a judgment, um, the condition of the judgment supplies unity to a manifold of incense um, in a way that allows the understanding to think it all under one rule, um, thus combining many possible cognitions or uh, acts of knowledge into one, right? So if we have the judgment, all cinnabar is red, and this is, so this is a categorical universal judgment. Um, and so the condition on which the, the rule of judgment is the rule according to which something has to be, well, the rule something has to follow to count as red, whatever that is. Um, and the condition on which we're applying the rule is the rule of the subject concept cinnabon. So in the manifold in sense, um, we're asserting that whatever and be unified under this condition as cinnabar, the, the rule of the predicate concept applies to. And that's the unity of the understanding. And in a syllogism, uh, reason gives a different kind of unity to the same possible cognitions. Uh, the unity of reason which is an explanation for why everything that meets that condition uh, falls under the rule. Right, so in a categorical syllogism, this judgment would, could be the conclusion and the syllogism would explain why. So it like explains why this applies where to whatever can be unified under this. Um, and it will 
the explanation will take the form of um, uh, subsuming this, uh, this condition under a known condition for the rule, right? So if there's something, some condition we already know under which things have to be read, and you could subsume cinnabar under that, um, then you would have a, a categorical syllogism proving that all cinnabar is read or explaining why all cinnabar is read. Right, so like if instead of all cinnabar is red, we have here, although this judgment is weird in lots of ways, but the judgment, all humans are, are oh, sorry. Um, judgment, all scholars are mortal. This is the conclusion. Assuming a scholar means is like a type of human being, right? I mean, I don't know if, I guess really maybe whales can be scholars and Martians can be scholars or whatever, but assuming a scholar is a type of human being. So we want to conclude all mortals are scholars. So there's a known condition of mortality, which is humanity, right? That is, we know a principle that all humans are mortal. And if we can subsume this condition under the condition, uh, the known condition, um, then we can explain the conclusion. So that subsumption is the minor premise of the syllogism where we you say all scholars are human. And that's the explanation. Why are all scholars mortal? Because they're human. And of course, this explanation only works if we already know the principle all humans are mortal. Um, and reason demands, I was just talking to Carl in the office hours about exactly what this means, why Kant talks that way, and why I like to talk that way. But we, I guess at least we could say reason's purpose is to supply this kind of unity. And why do I call it a kind of unity? Because it, you know, it applies to the whole judgment at once. So it gives like a, one explanation for why all the things that fall into that condition are mortal, which the original judgment didn't do, right? Like the original judgment uh, doesn't unify the its subject in that way. It doesn't. It, it could be true, even though it's for lots of different reasons. But reason demands that the unity of the understanding have an explanation. So reason is, out, is looking for the higher condition under which we can subsume the condition of this judgment to explain why it's true. Um, and... Um, um, and because reason demands that for every judgment, therefore, once you get this minor premise here, you can ask for an explanation of that, and so on. And reason keeps asking for them, right? That is, reason will never be satisfied with this judgment here unless this whole series of conditions is, is present. So like that's the logical function of reason and so far everything is fine, but then the transcendental illusion is um, that we take this demand of reason to be objective. That is, we think that reason demands there be something in the object, no matter what the object is that guarantees that this whole series uh, can be carried out. Um, whereas like really what reason demands is whatever judgment this is, it's always legitimate for me to ask for an explanation. That's what real, reason really demands. And that's what Kant calls the regulative use of the ideas. Um, 
where you know the um, the proper use of them is to not let the understanding rest with unexplained judgments, but to always ask, "Wait, why is that?" Right. Um, but that demands the totality only um, piece by piece. However far you've got, it always demands more. It doesn't. Um, um, uh, doesn't demand that you actually carry out infinitely many judgments. <laughs> um, so again, that's the proper regulative use of the ideas, but under the transcendental illusion, we 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 think of reasons demand on the understanding as um, um, instead of demand on the object. Now, I mean, remember, the understanding does make a demand on the object. That's what we tried to show in the transcendental deduction. Right? That is, the understanding uh, requires the object to conform to its categories or gives the law to nature, as Kant says. Right? But reason doesn't do that. And why? Because reason isn't the isn't the, a faculty of representing objects directly at all. Um, but um, um, and that's why when this demand comes along, as we think of the object, the understanding gets ro roped in. That is, um, we're asked to find some way of representing the object as guaranteed to um be unconditionally explained and um reason says uh okay understanding you show me this this guarantee and the understanding since they couldn't be a guarantee like that in experience whatever's given in experience is always conditioned and won't ever be sufficient to that demand the understanding says okay i have to represent something that um, can't be given an experience but that reason is assuring me is there and what predicates can i use well uh only the categories because the categories are transcendental concepts um the categories even though we can only really apply them within the realm of experience. They, they, um, they're not derived from experience. They don't contain that condition in the concept. And so the under, you know, understanding says, okay, I'm gonna use transcendental predicates to represent this object. And so we get uh, a theory of the self in terms of pre transcendental predicates, that is in terms of like absolute categories um substance then for quality we get simplicity um and for really uh sorry for quantity we get unity and then for modality we get um the possibility i think the best way to understand it is like possibility of going along with any external thing or something like that um and Similarly, in the antinomy, we got, you know, we also went down one of the columns in the table of categories, the way I draw the table of categories, um, we went down the second column and, you know, we got a demand for like total of the plurality of experiences, total of the division of experiences, total of the causal order and like a total of uh contingency upon uh, uh contingency of existence upon something <laughs> all right so uh um and the way i explained it is that here so these are supposed to correspond to the three types of syllogism because again there's going to be as many branches of the illusion as there are types of syllogism because the the illusion is like a demand for an unconditional explanation in the object and the three types of explanations you can ask for correspond to the three types of syllogism 
And the way I explained it is that the, the categorical syllogism corresponds to an, inter, an internal explanation. So here we're looking for an absolute in, internal condition of, all, of everything in experience. And I tried to explain why, I'm not going to try again, but I tried to explain why that ends up meaning a transcendental theory of the self or of the soul. Um, and uh, in the antinomy, we're looking for an absolute external condition. And I tried to explain why that means that we're looking for an explanation of any given event in terms of the world as a whole. Um, and, uh, now we're at the ideal. So the ideal should correspond to the disjunctive syllogism, right? This is corresponded to the categorical syllogism where the major premise is a categorical judgment, like all humans are mortal. This corresponds to the hypothetical syllogism where the major premise that is the first premise is the, is a hypothetical judgment, like, if uh, there is perfect justice, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. <laughs> and now finally we've got to the disjunctive syllogism where the major premise is a disjunctive judgment. Um, and what happens in a disjunctive judgment? So like the general form of the disjunctive judgment is, I guess, yeah, this is, So the general form of it, it, right, it can have two or more clauses. Um, and it says that exactly one of them is true. Right, so either this is true and these two are false, or this is true and these two are false, or this is true and these two are false. So, Kant, um, so how, first of all, I mean, I've tried to explain this several times, but I'm going to try again. <laughs> how is this like a combination of a categorical and a hypothetical judgment? Where by combination, Kant doesn't mean that it's not a different kind of judgment, that you can just like put together categorical hypothetical judgments, but he means it's a combination in the same sense the totality is a combination of plurality and uh, unity and plurality, because uh, totality is a plurality taken together as one. So similarly, we have like... Um, um, the the question here is like how is the the condition that's um, on which a rule is applied in a disjunctive judgment? How is that like a combination of an internal condition and an external condition? So I think. Um, Basically, the idea is that um, there's some concept and um, we can divide the internal possibilities of this concept, let's say three different ways. And we somehow use that to determine the complete range of external conditions. Right, so it's like, um,
it's like if we're in this part of this big concept here, if we're in this part, then on that condition, A must be B. And if we're in this part, then on that condition, C must be B. And on this part, on that condition, E must be F. And you have to say like only on that condition, right? Um, and so if that's true, since all three of these together add up to the complete internal condition of this concept, um, we've divided the possible external situation into um, exclusive and uh, mutually exclusive exhaustively into mutually exclusive parts, right? That is, either this has to be true, or this has to be true, or this has to be true. And that's why it's a combination of internal and external. Like the sum of all the external conditions adds up to the total internal condition. Now, I mean, um, you might ask, where is this? And so, okay, so first of all, like, why well, I think that's how it works. Well, I think that's what Kant means. So, um, oops. There he is. Um, The logical determination of a concept by reason is based upon a disjunctive syllogism in which the major premise contains a logical division, the division of the sphere of a universal concept, the minor premise limiting this sphere to a certain part, and the conclusion determining the concept by means of this part. So it's... Um, the major premise is this, then the minor premise rules out this and this, and so the conclusion is that we must be in this part of the concept and therefore this, that's the conclusion, right? So it's, so the minor, minor premise is like, not C is D or E is F. It's a negative disjunctive judgment. And the conclusion is this is a little bit of a problem because what syllogisms have this as a conclusion? How, how is the series going to go? Okay, I mean, but so if that's the right explanation, then generally speaking, this concept doesn't actually get named in the syllogism. Right, like this concept is like the general logical state of affairs that somehow like uh, is responsible for dividing up logical space, so to speak, into these three parts. Um, I mean, we talk a lot, a lot about logical space now, and so does Kant sometimes. Do people before Kant talk about logical space? That's a good question. Carl was also asking me after our office hours, like, what things about the way people think about these things now are, are still now are due to Kant? Maybe... Yeah, I doubt it. Leibniz must say that somewhere or something. Anyway, be that as it may. Um, so, um, I mean, of course, in Kant's example of a disjunctive judgment, so Kant's example of a disjunctive judgment is uh, the world either came into being by chance, um, by 
necessity or by design maybe i think i'm getting that wrong but anyway it's something like that so right the world came into into existence in one of these three ways um and there and but it you know and the implied syllogism like what kant says about it there because he's not talking about the syllogism there it's way back in the um in the table of judgments i think where he talks about this but he says like um that um the uh if two of the disjunct, disjuncts are false, um, that's uh, that doesn't make them useless. They they're useful in this disjunctive judgment because it's like a um, sign that tells us this isn't the right way and this isn't the right way, and so it directs you towards the right direction, right? So, I mean, I guess the syllogism he has in mind is something like. Either the world came into being by chance or by necessity or by design, but it didn't come into being by chance or by necessity. Therefore, it came into being by design, something like that, right? So, um, um, so there, well, so what is, even there, it's not 100% clear what's the subject in those clauses, but it's the same in all three clauses, right? Either the world came into being by B, or the world came into being, by D, or the world came into being by F. So, I mean, I guess the, like, the subject is the world's coming into being, the origin of the world. Um, like, if you, when people tell the history of logic from a certain point of view, what they'll say is that Aristotelian logic didn't have a way of dealing with relations. So that, for example, they couldn't explain what the relationship is between the concept world and the concept origin of the world. <laughs> I don't know if that's right or not, but anyway, I mean, that is, I don't know if that's a good way to think about the history of logic or not, maybe. But in any case, be that as it may, so that, the, you know, there, let's say the subject of all of them is the origin of the world. And so, like, now we understand we're dividing the origin world into three parts, and we know what three parts we're dividing it into. Um, and you don't have to really think about anything out here. You're just dividing the concept into three parts. And we say, well, we're not in this part, and we're not in this part, so we must be in this part. Um, um, but, and if you... To, if I were to read again that description of the distinctive syllogism that I just read from Kant, you would see that it's it's much easier to understand what's going on if he's talking about an example like that. So probably he is thinking about an example like that. However, it's not as if he thinks all disjunctive judgments have that form. Um, that it's always the same subject. Um, I mean, in fact, if it were always the same subject, and some of his predecessors, like Christian Wolff, um, would, I think, have been right to say that all judgments are really, really categorical. Right? So they would say something like that judgment just means the origin of the world is, and then the whole, the predicate is either by chance or blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, uh, but Kant, um, um, doesn't agree with them. And certainly, like I said, his example of a hypothetical syllogism is not like that. It's a different subject in the antecedent and the consequent. So that's why I tried to explain it in this more abstract way where, I mean, it's weird because in some sense, the subject concept of the syllogism uh, that is the, the subject of the conclusion. What we might think of as the subject of the conclusion is not actually stated in the syllogism. So the conclusion is A is B, but what it really means is we're in this part here, the A is B part of this, which we haven't named. So you probably, it would be nice if I could give you an example, but I can't really. 
I mean, I can give you a fake example, right? Like I could always just claim, you know, either the cat is in the chair or the cat is in the bed or the cat is eating, you know, right? Well, actually, no, see, I did it again. They have the same subject. It's more natural to think of disjunctive syllogisms where they have the same subject. Um, um, I could say something like, Either the cat is sleeping or the new cat food has come. <laughs> right. And like that be, that could be a disjunctive judgment. Um, and then I would say the cat is not sleeping, therefore the new cat food has come. And this like subject concept here would be something like, you know, the state of the household or something. <laughs> uh, um Yeah, I'm sure that wasn't a very helpful example. Um, but so the point is that the disjunctive syllogism, um, going back to abstractions, which I understand better than real life, <laughs> um, that the in the disjunctive syllogism, um, the way the conclusion is explained is in terms of a common ground. Um, there's like a common ground underlying all the alternatives. In the sense that each one of them is possible because it's allowed by one of the possible um, like uh, limitations of that common ground. So, um, so there's really like two unities here, actually. And so, by the way, so Kant compares this in one place, and this is, you know, why Kant likes to talk about logical space. And I guess also why we like to talk about logical space, if you think about it, <laughs> that, you know, he compares this to the way a figure is possible because it's because there's um it's a possible limitation of the common ground of all figures that is space um so as i was saying there's like two different unities here i mean there's the unity of reason which is the unity it gives to the conclusion the one explanation it gives to the conclusion but it's able to do that because of this other unity, the unified ground of possibility of all the alternatives. There's like one thing that makes all these alternatives, each of these alternatives possible, and which is actual depends on which part of it you're in, so to speak. So the ideal, that is the idea of reason in, in this part of the transcendental illusion is going to represent as somehow contained in the object, an unconditional explanation of that kind. Um, So the unity of any judgment about the empirical world, right? So again, like we start with some arbitrary empirical judgment, you know, like all cinnabar is red. And we say, well, um, um, this is the kind of explanation there has to be. There's, a single ground um, whose 
internal condition is the sum of all possible judgments. And they all, all the possible judgments add up to it in the sense that um, uh, each one of them is possible because it's consistent with this common ground. And I mean, um, Yeah. It has to be true no matter what the judgment is about. So all the possibilities of things in general are contained in this common ground. Every way that anything could be is just one of the alternatives that this makes possible. And so, I mean, notice that even though the original judgment we start with is empirical, we're looking for an unconditioned explanation of something like all cinnabar is red or all humans are mortal or whatever. Um, and so the unity that we're looking for is the unity of an empirical concept. Right? The unity of the, that is, the, it's, an explanation for why the unity of an empirical concept um, makes it possible to apply a rule. But um, um, the unity of the common ground is not restricted to empirical judgments. Right, so the unity of reason that we're looking for is the unity of reason in the explanation of this empirical judgment. But again, in, here in the disjunctive syllogism, this the unity of explanation is going to be due to a unity of, of ground that's um, that's uh, that includes not only the explanation of this, but also the explanation of all the possible alternatives. And since we like started describing this explanation in terms of transcendental predicates, because again, like it can't be anything about any particular empirical thing that makes this explanation possible. Reason demands that it always be possible. So we start thinking about this explanation in terms of transcendental predicates. And that means that we can't confine these possibilities that it's supposed to be allow allowing to empirical possibilities. We're talking about um, all things in general, right? That was the, um, I can write this down, but I can probably find it again.
The relations which are to be universally found in all our representations are one, relation to the subject, two, relation to objects, either as appearances or as objects of thought in general. If we combine the subdivision with the main division, blah, 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 we have three, the relation to the subject, the relation to the manifold of the object in, in the appearance, and the relation to all things in general. Right, so I just I got through trying to explain how the um, unconditional disjunctive explanation that we're looking for here, why that um, um, ends up uh, just as in the first part, we looked for the explanation in the subject. And in the second part, we looked for the explanation in all the objects of experience. Here, we're looking for the explanation in the ground of possibility of all things in general. Okay, so far so good. <laughs> Questions? Okay, so the question is though, um, um, exactly where does the transcendental illusion come in? I think that I think that's this is one of the hardest things to understand about this section, the ideal. Um, Kant doesn't make it clear exactly what the conclusion of the sophistical, that is dialectical inference of reason is supposed to be. Um, I mean, uh, Maybe it's not clear what I'm asking until I go on to explain like what the later what the further course of thought here is after this. But like you can see at this point, um, we haven't actually um, um, concluded that a certain thing exists. Right, far from it. We've just we've just concluded that there's some total of all possibilities, and any possibility that appears is like one alternative out of all of those. Um, so, like so far, even though I said we're looking for an explanation in the object, and that's true in a sense, right? Where that is. We're looking for something about all things in general that that allows always allows this kind of explanation, um, but it doesn't mean that uh, we've taken this common ground of possibility to be an object. I mean, if you think back to my like cat example, <laughs> either the cat is sleeping or the new cat food has arrived, you know, I mean, that I think that's why it was so hard for me to say what the concept whose sphere we're dividing there is, because it's, you know, it's not the concept of a certain object that has one of two states. Um, it's, it's just like the space of possibility that we're in, so to speak. Um, so, I mean, similarly here, right? Like, I mean, and in fact, the cat is sleeping and the new cat food that arrived are two of the judgments that are out here somewhere. And if they're really mutually, mutually exclusive, then, then they, they um, were thinking of as depending on some division of this common ground, but that doesn't mean we're thinking of this common ground as something like a cat. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, I guess, I mean, this is another reason, I guess, why it's 
so important to to notice that a general disjunctive judgment doesn't have the same subject in all the disjuncts. Um, because we are going to make a transition to thinking of this as a possible thing. And then we're going to make a transition to thinking of it as an actual thing. Right? And that that um, second transition is will be a proof of the existence of God in the transcendental sense. So, I mean, uh, the, the question is, though, like, at which of those steps are we involved in the transcendental illusion? And it's hard to tell from the way Kant talks because he sometimes starts saying something and like it doesn't become clear for a while that what he's saying is actually um, like um, back to that idea over there. Right, so this is B612, it's on page 496 in Camp, Camp Smith. If we admit something as existing, no matter what this something may be, we must also admit that there is something which exists necessarily. For the contingent exists, blah, 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 blah. This is the argument upon which reason basis is advanced to the primordial being. So not until the end of the paragraph does he, does he mention that this isn't his argument but that this is the dialectical argument, right? So, and sometimes maybe he never explains it that clearly, even at the end. <laughs> that's that's the problem here. It's hard to tell when, because he's as, when he's discussing dialectical arguments, it's hard to tell the difference between the argument he's making, which is he thinks is good, and the argument he's talking about, which he thinks is bad. <laughs> Um, but I think it's pretty clear that the transcendental illusion happens right away. What do I mean by that? So, like, uh, I go back. Oh, no, it's forward from there. Oh, no, it's just as up. Um, to know a thing completely, we must know every possible predicate. Uh -oh. What does he actually say? This is B601, and it's on page 489 in Kemp Smith. And I just noticed that it contains a word in brackets and that Kemp Smith inserted. And I'm wondering what Kant actually said and why I didn't look that up before. Okay. One must know. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an example. It's the same thing I talked about at the, about the meaning of manifold. It's an example of an adjective used as a noun, um, implying an unstated thing that it's modifying. So in order to, um, um, 
completely or perfectly know a thing. One must know all possible. <laughs> and there's there's no noun. <laughs> so, okay, so Kemp Smith is filling in predicates. Or every possible, I guess. Every possible. And he, Kemp Smith is filling in predicates. Well, that's good enough. All right. <laughs> um, okay. So um, to know a thing completely, we must know every possible predicate and must determine it thereby either affirmatively or negatively. Oops, now I've lost things. We must know, in order to know a thing completely, we must know every possible predicate and must determine it thereby either affirmatively or negatively. So um, this is a mistake, I think, already. Um, Meaning, um, It's not true that we know any empirical judgment by, by a limitation of some ground of all possibility in general. Um, because if, like, if this is an empirical judgment, then the sum total of possibilities that uh, it's or alternative that it's known to exclude is itself only known to be possible empirically a posteriori right that is we don't know what the alternatives are to to something being a certain way except because we've seen things actually be a different way Like for example, we don't know what all possible predicates of uh, empirical things are. We only know the ones we've actually seen. Um, So already when we get to that point, so that point, it's not maybe not exactly the beginning, but it's the point where we say that like um, the application of predicates like A and B um, implies a totality of all possible predicates, which we pick them out of by limitation. We've already made a mistake. That can't be how we know empirical predicates because we 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 only come to know each one of them empirically. So we never have the 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 total of the alternatives that are available and see, okay, it's that one. It's always, oh, that's one of the alternatives. <laughs> um So if that's already a mistake, I guess the question is, is that the con is that the conclusion of the disjunctive syllogism? I mean, sorry, is that the conclusion of the dialectical inference? Now, I mean, remember, this is confusing, but I pointed out that 
although Kant himself doesn't say anything about this, he just does it, right? Then in the paralogisms, the dialectical inferences are themselves categorical syllogisms. Um, and in the antinomy, the one example he gives us of a dialectical inference is itself a hypothetical syllogism. Now, I mean, it, it, I've said this several times in other lectures, so I don't know if I should go through the whole thing again, but I'll just say it's like the fact that the paralogisms correspond to explanation by categorical syllogisms and the antinomy explains, can of corresponds to explanations by hypothetical syllogisms, doesn't at all make it clear why the, why the dialectical inference in the paralogisms should itself be a categorical syllogism. It's going the other direction. It's not the, it's not part of that series. And similarly in the antinomy, if the pattern continues though, even though Kant hasn't drawn any attention to it, um, so maybe uh, it's just a coincidence or something, but if the pattern continues, we would expect to find in the ideal a, dial, a disjunctive syllogism which is a uh, sophism, and we expect to find it a, a sophisma figurae dictionis, right? That is a uh, um, fallacy of equivocation. Why is that flickering happening? Oh, for heaven's sakes. <sighs> That up. Now what? Uh, it's fixed. No more flickering. All right. Whether that was work it, worth it, I don't know. So we expect to find a disjunctive syllogism, which is a fallacy of equivocation. Um, and we expect the conclusion of it to be um, um something like this. So here's oops. Um.
So this is the bottom of B599. It's on page 488 in Kemp Smith. But everything as regards its possibility is likewise subject to the principle of complete determination, according to which, if all possible predicates of things be taken together with their contradictory opposites, then one of each pair of contradictory opposites must belong to it. Um, Right, and it's that which on the following page Kant says is equivalent to that thing about to know a thing perfectly, you must know all possible predicates. So um, we expect that to be the conclusion. Um, if that's not the conclusion, if the conclusion is one of the other mistakes we go on to make, then uh, what is this false conclusion? Like, it seems like it has to be the one that would be the conclusion of that dialectical syllogism. But um, then I don't know how to make a disjunctive syllogism that has that conclusion. I mean, This really seems to suggest a categorical syllogism, right? Everything as regards its possibility is blah, 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 but an empirical uh, object is a thing. Therefore, um, an empirical object as regards its possibility is subject to the principle of complete determination, et cetera. That's, you know, um, that's a syllogism you could e easily imagine coming in there. Um, it would have the right form of like inferring from something within the realm of experience to, to something which could never be given in experience. Um, but it's categorical syllogism, it's not disjunctive. I mean, it also perhaps you can see uh, where the equivocation is, right? Like thing is taken in, in that syllogism would be taken. Everything is, and here you have to fill in, like determined by one of each pair of contradictory opposites, et cetera, right? And then you say, an empirical object is a thing that is, it is real. You know, therefore, whatever, empirical object is determined by, so uh, you could say that, you know, this means empirical reality. This means transcendental reality, or this kind, this is a thing in itself. Right? Everything as such is blah, 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 blah. That is, everything in itself is, would be the real major premise. And then you would see why this is an equivocation. But again, like Kant doesn't write the syllogism anywhere, and it doesn't fit the pattern because it's categorical rather than disjunctive. Um, so possibly the pattern of the other two sections is broken here. Or possibly there's some other syllogism that Kant is has in mind that that he didn't write out that I don't know what it is. Okay. Um, Oh, Daniel says he didn't see any flickering. Maybe it was only on my screen then. All right.
anyway. Um, so that, like I said, the next step here is that um, reason is going to uh, look for a thing at the end of, of this relation. So this is like a relation to the object of every empirical concept. It's, you know, it's an alternative allowed by this common ground of all possibility. That is the sum of all possible predicates of anything. So I mean, so far we're not thinking of it as a thing. We're just talk. We're just thinking of it as a totality of alternatives, as many possible things, all possible things. But now, um, um, So, okay, but now um, we start to think, we start to think that there's a thing we can put here. And how does that work? So, um, and it's, it's this, it's this step that makes it called the ideal. This step that we don't carry out in the other two cases. Um, so, um, Kant defines an ideal as an idea taken to represent an individual object. So, um, and, uh, We think that um, we have represented an individual object in inferring that this this common ground of all possibility. So um, now this works. This this happens because. We think of all possible predicates. We think we know something about them in advance. So we definitely can't list them all. Right? I mean, we can't list all possible empirical predicates because we only know what uh, empirical predicates are possible a posteriori. And we can't list any possible predicates that are not empirical, um, except the transcendental ones. So, uh, um, so we definitely can't list all possible predicates. But we think we know something about all possible predicates in advance. Namely, that each one of them is either real or negative. So we think, you know, we have all possible predicates. We can divide them into real predicates and negative predicates. Um, 
So this is a transcendental application of the category of, of categories of quality, right? Or something like that. We're, we're, um, um, I'll explain it so the mistake comes out clearly. Right. So, I mean, the truth is that the categories of um, uh, reality and negation um, um, Maybe this isn't really a mistake. Any predicate regarded transcendentally has to be either real or negative, if we know it at all. But the mistake is, um, I'm not sure about this, but the mistake is, so we think the real predicates, the negative predicates are just negations of the real predicates. Right, so we have here like, you know, heavy and not heavy, white and not white, and so on. We can't list all the things that go on the real side. And therefore, we can't all list all the things that go on the negative side. But we know every predicate goes on one of these sides. And then we say, okay, well, let's form the concept. Well, okay, so then we say, first of all, this totality of all possible predicates um, really only has to contain these, right? That is when we say that every alternative is like it's just a limitation of this general sum of all possibilities. It's enough to include all the positive possibilities. The negative ones are just like not belonging to that part, to that alternative, right? So here we have the total of all real predicates that is all positive predicates. We can still use this as the common ground that explains every possible alternative. And then we say, moreover, Take this concept here of every possible real predicate. We don't know what's on the list, but we know that this whole thing, well, so first of all, we know that it completely determines something. Um, right? That is, it chooses one out of each pair. Oh, can you see what I'm drawing? Yeah, no, I just see something that's, it, it seems frozen. Uh, I wish someone had mentioned that before. All right. I just I'm just not sure if it's my end or... No, no, it's... I'm still having trouble with this camera. Uh, when that happens, someone should tell me because... Oh, I see it in the chat now, but I wasn't looking at the chat. Yeah, see, this is what I was drawing. I was drawing this whole thing and I was talking about it. <laughs> let, let me let me try again, right? So we so we say, okay, we can divide all possible predicates, even though we don't know what they are. We can divide them into real ones and negative ones. 
So the real side, we have heavy, white, and infinitely many other alternatives, uh, most of which we don't know and we'll never know because they're not even empirical predicates. Um, and then on the other side, we just have the negation of all of those. So we say it's enough to just to get this ground of possibility. It's enough to just take the positive things. Right? Like the every possible thing is some like combination of possible positive predicates. And he just left out some of the others. That's what, right? So we just have to, to get a possible thing, we just have to choose some of these. We don't have to choose any of these, we just don't choose the real one that corresponds to them. So we don't need this part. Right? So this is the point where Kant says, like, um, This is back on page 489, 601. Although this idea of the sum total of all possibility, and so far as it serves as the condition of the complete determination of each and every thing, is itself undetermined in respect to the predicates which may constitute it, right? That's what I keep saying that, like, we don't know of this. Although the idea of the sum total of all possibility, and so far as it serves as the condition of the complete determination of each and every thing, is itself undetermined in respect to the predicates which may, which may constitute it, we don't know the things on this list, and we can't know them. And is thought by us as being nothing more than the sum total of all possible predicates, we yet find on closer scrutiny that this idea as a primordial concept excludes a number of predicates which as derivative are already given through other predicates or which are incompatible with others. Right, that is the concept of the sum total of all possibility just includes all of these, you now think. And then we think, well, here we have a possible thing. Is I haven't given you the whole list of all its predicates, but I've given you uh, like um, algorithm, so to speak, that um, that completely specifies them. Namely, go down this list and always pick the positive. Never just pick the negative. Now, I mean, this is also a mistake. That's what I've been trying to get at for a while now. This, this is also a mistake, and it's weird to find it here because this is one of the mistakes from the amphibolism. In fact, it seems like we have two of the mistakes from the amphiboly here. So one is the mistake that... Um, um, that says that two positive predicates can't negate each other, can't be opposed to each other, right? Remember, that was what, that was one of the conclusions that Leibniz is supposed to have drawn um, from his incorrect use of the concepts of reflection, in particular, the concepts corresponding to quality, which is what we're talking about here, right? Because like these, this, we're talking about the reality that is the thingness of a thing. The thing is a substance, but its reality is a quality. So you remember reality is one of the categories of quality or one of the moments of the category of quality. So, um, so the concept of agreement and opposition, which corresponds to the category of quality, Leibniz is supposed to have falsely concluded that the only way that something could be negated, it could be uh, opposed or uh, um, canceled, would be by its contradictory opposites. And then this is just what Leibniz actually, in fact, uses that principle for, to show that if you choose all positive predicates, you can't get something impossible. 
they can't be incompatible with each other because they're all positive and they don't, they can't interfere with each other. But as Kant pointed out in the Amphiboly, uh, um, in when it comes to empirical uh, reality, there is a way that two realities can oppose each other. And it's, you know, it's made possible by the opposition of directions in space. Which is like, um, there's no qualitative difference, so to speak, between the force in this direction, and the force in this direction. I mean, there is a kind of quality that is an intensive quantity or degree, which is this angle between the two forces, right? And we actually call the way we measure angles degrees. <laughs> this, um, so, uh, um, uh, but that's but that quality is a quality of space, not of objects. It's it 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 has to do with the nature of our form of intuition. The forces themselves are exactly the same kind, and yet they can cancel each other. So therefore, it's not true. Even if it's true, yeah, we can sort things into net positive like real amounts, like this much force versus the absence of that much force or zero force, um, we can't say that as long as you only have realities here, they don't interfere with each other. So in taking this step from, so the, the way I'm understanding it, I think, is that the initial conclusion of the dialectical syllogism is just that we have a concept of the totality of all possibility. That itself is a transcendental illusion. We don't have that. Um, what Things are really completely determined, as Kant says at some point, in relation to the whole of experience. Which whole, which is, which whole is never given. So they're, they're never, we're never finished determining them. Um, but uh, in any case, it, it's not a sum of a ground of all possible predicates in general. So, um, but we make this mistake and then we make a further mistake, but the further mistake comes from somewhere else. It isn't part of the transcendental illusion per se. It's just like another mistake that gets drawn in. Um, and I, I, I think this is right partly because we'll see in the reading for next time that Kant says um, that in um, proving the existence of God, reason has like pulled out all the dialectical stops, so to speak. Like it's made every mistake it possibly can. <laughs> So not just the initial one of the transcendental illusion, but then a whole bunch of other ones come on. Okay. So. Not, I'm not doing that then. So now, I mean, this is the concept, if we think of this as the concept of an object, and this is what I can say, there's another mistake to me on theory. We think because it's completely determined, it's determined it's one individual, right? That's, that's based on the principle of the identity of indiscernibles, which was Leibniz's first error in the Amphiboly, the one involving the concepts of identity and difference. So, uh, um, so we think that this we have one um, we, we've given a way of choosing one out of every pair of contradictory opposites and we know that 
the the way yields a possible thing and that the possible thing has every positive amount of thingness or reality. So it's the realest possible thing, right? Which is why Kant keeps calling it ens realissimum, right? Ens means being. And this means most real, the most real being. So we think we've shown that we have a representation of the most real being. I mean, it's weird. It's kind of an indirect representation, right? Because we don't actually have the, the rule, but we have the rule for the rule. <laughs> Right? As we can tell you, if you knew all the possible predicates, how to pick the ones that it has. <laughs> um, so uh, this is the representation of something greater than which nothing can be thought or whatever. That's Anselm's formulation. Um, and so uh, this is something like a concept of God. But I mean, there's a there's a couple of problems with it. One problem is that it's like to supply this ground of possibility for all the alternatives, it doesn't have to exist, right? It's enough that we have the representation of the sum of all possibility. So, okay, we can think of that as a representation of an individual thing if we want, but the explanation didn't rely on a thing like that existing. It just relied on having a representation of the sum total of all possibilities. So if we want theology in the sense of uh, science that's about something, some, something that exists, <laughs> then we're still missing a piece. Now, mostly we're going to discuss that next time when we discuss the impossibility of the proofs, as Kant puts it, right? Like he goes, he he thinks he has a list of all possible proofs of the exist, all possible theoretical proofs of the existence of God. In the practical philosophy, Kant has his own proof of the existence of God, but it works very differently and it proves something different. <laughs> um, but um, but he, has, he thinks he has a list of all possible theoretical proofs of the existence of God, and he explains the mistake in all of them. And it's basically the same mistake as usual. So, um, but right, so we haven't got to that yet. But there's another issue even before that. This doesn't seem like the object of God, the, like the concept of God, right? I mean, we've thrown in like a zillion miscellaneous predicates here. Um, What we expect is a list of transcendental predicates. And we expect it to be a short list. In fact, what we kind of expect is the third column on the table of categories, right? That is totality, limitation, community, and necessity. I mean, we expect that both from traditional philosophical theology, where God certainly doesn't get corporeal predicates like heavy, 
right? Like God is the heaviest possible thing. God is heavier than everything. You know, God smells stronger than everything, right? They don't expect that kind of predicates to be here. We expect things like simple, necessary, eternal, um, etc. Um, but also, we expect that from the pattern of the um, transcendental dialectic, right? We ex just as the soul and the world as a whole were were described in terms of categories like absolute versions of categories or something like that. That's what, that's what you expect the the, script, the, um, the concept of God to come out. And, you know, I mean, so, and Kant actually calls the dialectical science that we're trying um, mistakenly to found here, he calls it transcendental theology, right? Which further serves to emphasize this point that, what we ought to get here is simple transcendental predicates, not a list of every possible predicate. So um, don't have time to go into this very much. Um, I'll just say, although there's a couple places in the ideal where it seems like maybe Kant is listing transcendental predicates of God, um, Neither of them are entirely clear. Um, and they don't seem to hit that third column as we would expect. So maybe, again, the pattern is broken here. Maybe the two ways of breaking the pattern go together. I don't know. But what I do want to point to is this. that So this is on B607, and it's page 492 in Kemp Smith. Um, we cannot say that a primordial being consists of a number of derivative beings. Well, there's a step left out for me to get to this. Do I have time to do it? I don't. I'm going to have to talk about this next time. Because um, I had to first talk about how the fourth antinomy comes in here. Um but I'll just say briefly what the conclusion is here, right? So the, the conclusion is that this uh, um, ens realissimum uh, must actually be something simple. It must be absolutely simple, not divisible into parts in any way. And then we get, consequently, the derivation of all other possibility from this primordial being cannot, strictly speaking, be regarded as a limitation of its supreme reality, and as it were, a division of it. Although in our first rough statements we have used such language. On the contrary, the supreme reality must condition the possibility of all things as their ground, not as their sum. And the manifoldness of things must therefore rest not on the limitation of the primordial being itself, but on all that follows from it. Right, including therein all our sensibility. So the idea is this, and this is, uh, well, I don't even have time to say this really, but <laughs> this is the last thing I need to say. That, oh. The idea is, and there's a point in the third meditation where Descartes makes exactly the same move. It's a move that we have to make if we're going to get anything that looks like theology, but it's suspicious. And the move is to say, oh, actually, this doesn't contain all reality formally. It contains all reality eminently. That is, it contains all the perfections that created things have, but in a higher sense. And in such a way that in the higher sense, they're all the same and it's simple, even though um, in its consequences, it's multiple. Um, so, uh, um, 
that's the way we're going to get from a miscellaneous collection of every predicate, most of which we would never want to attribute to God, to something that's absolute and simple and necessary, and yet somehow grounds the possibility of everything contingent. Okay, and that's all I have time for. So I will see you maybe in person. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see on Wednesday. Bye.